Welcome to my podcast, Why Didn't Anyone Tell Me This? With my guests, we are discussing health issues, questions you may have about your health, and debunking some of the many myths around our health. And it's an absolute pleasure today to be talking to Susan Saunders, who I've been trying to nail down since last year. She was on my very first list of people to be on my podcast. But here we are today. I'm so excited. We are going to talk about how to age well. Now, Susan is a health coach helping women over 50 reduce dementia risk and optimize brain health with science-backed habits. She's the author of three books about healthy aging and longevity. She co-wrote the bestseller, The Age Well Project, and the blog of the same name, and authored The Age Well Plan. And her most recent publication is The Power Decade, How to Thrive After Menopause. And that's out right now. She has a high level qualification as a dementia prevention coach with neuroscientist Dr. Dale Breesden, author of The End of Alzheimer's, and was one of the first coaches in the UK to qualify as a coach on his program. She has coached hundreds of people globally to build habits scientifically shown to reduce dementia risk. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much, Joyce. I'm so happy to be here. And so I feel it's a real privilege to be invited. And I'm so thrilled that we've been able to make it happen. So thank you. And I've got to say, I have never had so many questions for a guest as I've got for you. So I I have reduced a lot. I had so many things. We need to meet over a drink one night for sure. But let's start. (laughs) Let's start how I start with all my guests. Let's hear a little bit about your career. I've, I obviously, I'm, a, I'm a, a teacher and I love hearing about people's careers, journeys, and what led you to work on reducing dementia and improving women's health? So my journey to this point really started when I was 36. I had a toddler and a newborn. I was working full time as a TV producer. That was my previous career. And my mum was diagnosed with dementia. So that was obviously terrible for her, but it was also an enormous shock for me. I just didn't know what to do. I had no idea how to be a carer. I had no role models. I had no friends in a similar situation. Uh, So I really had to feel my way while juggling tiny children and a very demanding job. And what made it more person even more pertinent for me was that as a teenager I had watched my mum care for her mum who also had dementia so I could see this pattern and I thought I wanted to do absolutely everything I could to reduce the risk of my daughters having to do the same thing for me so that started me on the journey really thinking about what you know what can I do what what is out there and it was quite clear at that point there was no medication for dementia and uh, Alzheimer's uh, and I started reading a lot and that led me to writing a blog the age well project blog with my friend Annabelle uh, which we've been doing for 10 years now uh, five years ago the first book the age well project came out which is very exciting and I loved that and had no idea that I was going to become an author in my 50s you know that was really exciting but while we were writing the book, I thought, I, I want to do more than just write stuff down. I want to talk to people and, and help them more, more directly. And I qualified as a coach. And when I found out that Dr. Bredesen, uh, whose work I had followed right from his very early uh, pilot studies, um, was teaching a, a coaching qualification uh, in uh, reducing dementia risk, I thought, right, that that is for me that is that is what I want to do fantastic I think I think having those personal stories and the the passion behind why someone goes down a particular route is is so important to hear and we are going to talk a lot about dementia my my mother had dementia all her sisters had dementia so it's I'm sure everybody knows somebody who's got dementia and Alzheimer's so we're, we're going to come back to that but we're also going to talk about aging and I want to start with, with with talking about aging in general, I, I'm researching for my next book by interview, interviewing 50 inspirational and happy women over 50. So I can write a book about positive aging as I totally think that 
over 50 can be our most creative and inspirational years. At a conference a few weeks ago, I said if I was an employer, I'd be employing postmenopausal women. I think I think they're amazing, amazing. So I wanted to start by asking you the first question I'm asking the women I'm interviewing. What do you think about ageing? And for you specifically, you called your book The Power Decade. Do you think that life after menopause is the power decade? So tell us about ageing and the power decade. Well, I mean, the old cliche is that ageing is better than the alternative, isn't it? <laughs> you know, at least we are still here. And I think for me, what is so important, what has been so important is the realisation is is the realization that a lot of this and what happens and how I feel and how I age is in my hands. And I realize that I'm speaking from a place of privilege, but we can change the way we age. We can make a difference with quite simple lifestyle changes and uh, additions. And I, I think that's, that's really important. And we have all this time. When I started researching the power decade, when I realized I wanted to write a book about health after menopause, I was looking at the statistics. And statistically, the average British woman in the UK lives half her life post menopause. I mean, that, and we, we kind of have this, this narrative that menopause or you like know, a post menopause is kind of near the end. And it's not, it's literally, it's halfway through adult life. I mean, that's just extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, it just sort of blew the doors off as far as I was concerned. It's like, right, okay. But we also know that estrogen is this wonderful kind of suit of armor that protects us, that keeps us healthy and strong. And when it declines, we lose that. You, know, it's not estrogen. I know you know is not just a hormone of reproduction. And you know, for me, that's be you know that has been a, a a learning curve. It's not just about babies and periods. It's protecting our brains and our bones and our cardiovascular system, and all those things. And you, know, when that declines, we do have to look after ourselves. And we know again statistically by our mid-60s, the chronic conditions of aging are more likely to be kicking in. So if the average, average, I know no one's average, average age of menopause is 51, and by mid-60s, chronic conditions of aging are more likely to kick in, then we have got this 10 years or so, this decade, to really look after our health to really power up and take you know, take control um of of our of our lives and our joy and our health and you know everything that that goes with it it's i feel like this time between our early 50s and mid 60s is a kind of gift you we've done a lot of the hard graft we've built careers we may have raised families we may have cared or still be caring for um older parents um and so we've but we have done a lot of the hard graft and we know by our mid-60s life is likely potentially to be changing there might be retirement downsizing etc but we've got this sort of time in between to really grab hold of um and we're free of that rolling monthly tide of menstruation and all the stuff that comes with that and i feel like we're kind of liberated and and we are let free and that is what the power decade is about i couldn't agree with you more i i just but i i think we need to really shout this message out there because there is this narrative about aging is something terrible and when i when i say such positive things about being post-menopause lots of younger women say i've never heard anyone say that and I think we're doing an injustice to our younger people by thinking that once you've gone through the menopause, you've turned into some old crone who's just going to shrivel up yeah. and do nothing. And and people like you and I, are, are we're really on a crusade to, to try, try and change that. As you say, it's in our hands. I think that's a great 
way of describing that because I, when I've tried to talk to women about this and I, we were at a meeting yesterday and one of the GPs said, when I talk about lifestyle, the women gloss over, they sort of glaze over, but we have to hopefully get this message across that there are things that we can do and we must find the time. I hear women say, I don't have the time. It's in our hands. And th there's different ways of describing this. You've talked about the three M's, mindset, meals and movement in the power decade. But really, well, let's go into some of these really important ways of looking after our well-being and having that power decade. So um, we've, we've got, uh, you've talked about better brain health, through nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress, cognitive engagement, and the environment, both social and built. And those are th all things that I talk about. And I've seen so many people, we're all on the same page, trying to shout about, let's look after these pillars and really improve our, our brain health, our general health. So I'm, I'm, we haven't got time to go through all of them, but let's really start with a major issue, which is women's brain health. And um, dementia and and Alzheimer's, which which are a problem, and and I'm sure everyone knows now that women are more prone to these diseases than men. And there are, unfortunately, we were just talking about this before we came on. But I've met too many women who have told me that they're taking HRT just because they've believed this narrative that's going around that taking HRT will protect them against against Alzheimer's and dementia. So. What do you feel about the HRT story and how do you think women can look after our brain health to prevent dementia and Alzheimer's? I'll come back to the HRT thing uh, because I'm a health coach, not a doctor, and I, you know, I can't prescribe or give medical advice, but I'll come back to, to my views. But just in terms of what we can do generally is you know, we have to think holistically you, know, you mentioned the six pillars and uh it's so important that we think beyond just diet and exercise i was talking to a woman yesterday and she was uh she is very keen to reduce her risk of dementia and she kept saying well i you know i need to be better at cooking and i need to do this and i had to say actually let's think of all the other things too it's not you know it's not just what we eat and we know, you know there's so much research now that shows that uh, lifestyle has a huge impact on our dementia risk you we know that you know, the mind diet uh, reduces dementia risk by around 50 percent we know, you know the world health organization has said that a uh, healthy lifestyle reduces dementia risk by around 40%. There are so many different stats and, and pieces of research out there. So I think it's, um, you know, it's really important that we do talk about this and we know about it. And as you say, you know, women are twice as likely as men to, um, to get dementia. So you know, it's really important that, that women are focusing on it and focusing on it as soon as possible. You know, dementia is not a condition of old age. It's a condition of midlife that manifests itself 20 or 30 years later. So you know, we know that the starting point for brain changes is somewhere between our sort of mid 40s and 50s. So your know, midlife is really the time to be focusing on brain health. Um, but I think, and also, you know, we know that during the menopause transition, women go through uh, a dramatic change in their brains. Dr. Lisa Moscone has described uh, menopause as a neurological transition. There's so, so much of the work of estrogen is done in the brain. But that doesn't mean that, in my understanding, there is enough evidence that HRT is going to prevent dementia risk. There is some really interesting research in this area. There are some really good, uh, there are some, there's some good research that suggests that it, that HRT may reduce risk in certain, you know, in certain cases, in certain, you know, beyond, within certain parameters. That is my understanding, but I'm not a doctor. And so I can't give advice on medication. I spent a full day um, last summer um, I'm, I think most people know I'm a cold water swimmer and someone lends me their beach hut every now and then. And I went to the beach hut 
with all the recent clinical studies about HRT and dementia. And I sat there and I read them all <laughs> with no interruptions. And um, for me, the you know, looking really deeply into the data, if the if the women are just taking estrogen, um, so they've if they've had a hysterectomy, they can just take estrogen. Though some of those studies were the ones that were showing um, a possible link between reducing the risk, but for the majority of women who were taking estrogen and progesterone, it seemed that progesterone was having some effect. And that some studies said that taking estrogen to progesterone made it made dementia risk higher. Um, and some said it didn't really make any difference. So that that was my interpretation. I'm you know, this is not my field. I am going to be uh, asking. We've got a wonderful, very large team at, at UCL that work on dementia and Alzheimer's. So. I'm going to be getting several of them over the next few months to give us the lowdown on what they feel. But I have asked them specific. I've asked some of them, some of the professors there, what they think about taking HRT. And they said that there's that in their view, there's no evidence. And certainly the Alzheimer's and dementia societies, it's not something that they list. But they do list, as you say, about nutrition and other ways to reduce the risk. But I wanted to move on a little bit now to stress and you said in your book you've called uh, managing stress is an essential life skill and it's something we're talking so much more about now and I think in my view we're leading so much more stressful lives than we've ever led before we're being bombarded by information and data and you know rushing everyone's rushing around now um tell us more about reducing stress as an essential life skill yeah, we know stress has a hugely debilitating effect on the brain and on you know, and on how we age more generally. And I, you know, I've thought thought about this a lot, and I've had a lot of stress in my life in different ways. And ultimately, it comes down to the fact we're not designed for this world that we live in. You know, I used to think that you know, stress was very kind of binary: you're either stressed or you're not. But actually, it's not. It's not going to go away completely. Um, what you, we are, we are these sort of hunter gatherers designed to roam the plains or whatever, the savannah, and we're living in boxes and driving cars and we don't see much daylight and we're stuck on these little screens and all this sort of stuff. Of course, we're going to be stressed. Um, and we can't just get rid of that, but we can manage our response to stress. And I think it's really important to take ownership of our response to stressful situations. Spending time trying to evaluate why we feel a certain way about a situation and work out whether we can reframe that situation in some way. You know, these are really important life skills uh, that where we where we look, you know, look look at ourselves and look at our reactions and and try it and try it and moderate those. And I think another really important life skill is building habits. I think habits are really really important. Habits that dissipate stress, that give us some sort of release. And this isn't rocket science. You know, I'm not the first person to say that exercise and creative activities and meditation and time with friends and time with outside at time spent outside all dissipate stress again there's lots of research that you know, that shows this um but it's fine it is finding the time and i know you said a lot of people say oh i haven't got time but it it's i think this is really where we are post-menopause is that we have to find the time we have to find a way through this and think okay my life is currently very stressful for example caring for older parents you know I hear this a lot um who can I ask for help where can I go at what point can I say no to another request and say, I'm sorry, I can't do that because that is the time that I walk outside with a friend or that is the time I have put aside for a creative endeavour of some sort, uh, some sort of pastime. So it, it's, it is that taking ownership. It's taking ownership of our health, taking ownership of our stress levels. You're so right. We, we really have to do that. And um, 
in the last year, I think with so many of us working at home more, <clears throat> I know too many people who just sit at their desk all day and, and we get on earlier now. I, I normally start work now about half past seven. I would, I would never have done that before COVID. Um, and, and making that time and understanding that taking a break and going for a, a walk outside in the fresh air is going to help our creativity and help whatever task we're trying to do at work. But slogging through it and not moving is is saturating and increasing yeah. our stress. So it's, it's, it seems so crazy, doesn't it, that we we're not own, owning it. Some people are just getting more and more stressed without having those tools that can reduce their stress. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And it's really about making that kind of mental and emotional effort to step back and say, you know, what is this situation? How can I carve out some time and space to think about it and work through it and talk to my boss or my family or whatever, whatever the issue is? Um, and, and of course, you know, we're better employees and better family members you know, if we've done that so every you know everybody benefits you know it's the old cliche of putting your oxygen mask on first but it's it's a cliche for a reason because it's right yes yes absolutely so in the mornings i go to a fitness class that's why i'm quite rosy i've just done body attack <laughs> it was quite a few hours ago but i'm still quite rosy um and so i used to feel guilty by saying to people i can't have a meeting between you know, 10 and 11 or 9 and 10 because I'm going to an exercise class. But but now I, I'm not feeling guilty. I thought, no, it's so important for my well-being that I'm going to do that and I'll make the meetings happen later. Uh, but wrapped up with, that, with yeah. that, you talk a lot about joy, the importance of joy, and something that I, I, I really am very passionate about is about happiness and joy. What would you say to those women who are struggling to find happiness and joy in their lives? I think take it very, very slowly. Find one thing that sparks joy. And that can be a very small thing and you know, a small walk, time in the garden, something like that. And then do it again and keep doing it and find the time to do it and then find something else. Um, and as I said, with stress, you seek help. You who 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 can support you? Who can help you through this? And, and to find more of those opportunities to do the joyful things. Uh, and 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 also, I think take a moment to enjoy them to save you know, to savor that moment. You, we if we take time to savor something and say, oh, I'm enjoying this, or I like this, or this that's pretty. I'm like enjoy looking at that it actually locks the benefits into our brains more and therefore we're more likely to do it again and I think more broadly we have to ask ourselves who am I post-menopause we've been through this enormous transition we are different people uh, when we come out of it we've been you know, bound to this rolling tide of hormones since since we were kids since we were 13 14 and here we are maybe 40 years later going oh well who am i now what does this person want what sparks joy in this person and actually ironically we often find what sparks joy in us uh, is the is the same thing that sparked joy pre-puberty you I keep hearing and I feel this myself going back to the things that you loved when you were a kid actually um you know I've just sort of slightly got back into gardening which I'm trying to do very badly um but you know I loved it when I was a little kid but I really haven't touched it for 40 years um and you know I, I used to make things a lot when I was a kid as well, getting back to that you know, so it, it's it's finding who you are and what that person enjoys I'm I'm brimming, brimming over with happiness. I just absolutely agree so much with with everything you say. You know, and I I think it's important. Women are we are transforming post menopause, and we do need to reflect and think what's going to bring me joy and happiness. And every I've asked lots and lots yeah. of people what makes them happy. Everyone says something different. Some might say 
sitting on the sofa with a book. Some might say, you know, an adventure. We've all got our own ways of making ourselves happy, but we, but we do need to do it. I think we need to do a bit of work around the menopause time to rediscover ourselves, reinvent ourselves, see what we we really want, and and yeah, as you say, it it could be could be anything, and and definitely pre puberty. You know what we did? We played. And then we become yeah. teenagers, we become a bit more self-conscious, and then next thing we're in a career and kids and etc. So I think, yeah, postmenopausal women, it's a really important time to just figure out who you are. And lots of women are using the word, I feel now I'm my authentic self. And we used to call it a midlife mm. crisis. It's not, it's not a crisis. It's a wonderful time of transforming into this wonderful person who's going to enjoy the next decades of their lives. Yeah. And, and you've talked about yeah. creativity. The second, the second half. Yeah, the second Sorry, half. Yes, the second half of their, of, of their adult life. And you, who are you going to be in the second half? You've done the first half. Who are you going to be in the second half? And, yeah, how are you going to play and enjoy it? And I, I think that's... I, I, I'm not undermine, going to undermine that the going through the menopause transition is very, very difficult for lots of women. But in a, in a way, it's good to embrace it that we've got this wake up call, which men don't have. And we've got this time to, you know, re, as I said, reinvent ourselves. So it's I, I think it's so, so exciting to enter post menopause stage. And many women say it's the best decades of their life, as, as you've said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I wanted to call the book The Power Decade and make it feel positive and powerful because that's how I was feeling. You know, I feel powerful, more powerful than I have done before, more in control of my life. And that's really exciting. I think the foundation for that has to be good health or the best health that we can achieve. Obviously, you, there are issues as we get older but the achieving the best health we can is the, the sort of basis for the for this very powerful strong wise identity that we step into as we go through the transition and you've already mentioned creativity i i do feel many women have told me they are they've reawakened their creativity it's something that they lost especially during at school i think some schools knock the creativity out of children and it's something that they lost for for decades but exploring that creativity and exploring hobbies um it's again a question that i've been asking in my book and i think we we really blossom in different ways um is there any, any creativity or hobbies that you've looked at again for yourself that you've taken up at this time well, yes, as I said, I'm trying to get back into gardening because it's re gardening's really good for your health. It's really good for aging well. If you want to age well, garden, because it's physical activity. It brings you into contact with the soil and plants. And actually, that's really good for the gut microbiome, which is really important for longevity and, and brain health as we get older. Uh, it's purpose it gives us purpose and a kind of long-term view you have to wait for things to grow and actually purpose and passion are really really important as we get older having a purpose is probably one of the most important things we can do if we want to age well uh so you know gardening certainly gives you uh that and yeah and i think creativity like as a kid i used to sew a lot and i really feel i haven't started doing it again but i really feel drawn back to it like i keep thinking about it it's almost like sort of earworm like oh I should I could do that I could do that so I feel I feel that's coming but I think I think it might have been Rachel Lancaster who talked in my book about a different kind of fertility that we um that we get to you know, we we've had you know, for some women obviously not for all women a, a fertile time of life or time in which we hoped we were fertile and now we know that's gone so and that is difficult, I know, sometimes uh, to to go through that loss. But it, as we come out of it, there's a different kind of fertility and a, you know, an opportunity to create something else. And it sort of doesn't really matter what it is. Um, I think I know that anything we do with our hands, there is a connection to the brain, 
to mental health, to parts of the brain which help us de-stress, to the actual physical doing a thing with our hands, if that's gardening or pottery or painting or sewing, whatever, there, there is a direct connection to parts of the brain that, that help us de-stress. So yeah, that, that's why. That's why we should be kind of getting creative and getting our hands dirty. The gardening. <laughs> um, I'm looking at my garden now. I've got quite a big garden because um, I live in the countryside. But um, it, various times in my life, it has grabbed me. And you know, as you say, you're you're nurturing things. You're you know touching the earth. It's and you're outside. It's, it's ticks so many boxes. Exercise. Um, I'm and so many women have told me that it brings them such joy. I'm still trying to get into it. Um, I've got lots of stinging nettles. I did some work last week. I've got brambles. I've got scratches on my arms and my legs and itches. from. So I this year, gardening is, um, it does go on my fishing board every year, actually. But this year, I'm really going to try and, and get back in, in with that soil. And it must be good for dementia as well, being out, um, doing those sorts of things and creativity as well. Do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's so, so important for brain health. Definitely one of the, the pillars of better brain health is um, cognitive engagement. So, yeah, anything you're learning, anything you're doing uh, is is really good for uh, cognition. And, of course, being outside and being active, really, really important. We've got to all get out in our gardens. <laughs> um, let's move on to nutrition um I, I just I'm so frustrated with our planet um you know this everyone's talking about ultra processed foods I don't understand why we allow companies to make foods that are so bad for our health you know we we have warnings on cigarettes we have warnings on alcohol we have limitations to buying these products but we don't have these limitations and warnings on so many of these foods. And if you look around the supermarket, it's it's just so full of, well, I don't know, but so much in the supermarket is very, very bad for us. So what, what are the key issues that you'd like to give, you know, let women know around their nutrition? And I know that you, you changed your diet uh, post-menopause. So tell us a bit about that. Yes, it's so interesting you mentioned the ultra-processed foods. I mean, they're sold because they make profit. That, you know, that's how the economy works. And I do say to women who are struggling to reduce their intake of ultra-processed foods, of you know, very processed sugary foods, it's not your fault. <laughs> Multi-billions of pounds are spent marketing this stuff to you, and we are hardwired to want it because our you know, ancestors who were roaming the savannah and you know, not being as stressed as we are now needed to know what tasted good and what was going to give them energy and that was sweet things and fatty things because you know, food was very scarce now food isn't scarce but we're still hardwired to want the sweet things and the fatty things so 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 many women beat themselves up about cravings and all the rest of it it's well you're designed for that and these huge corporations are making enormous amounts of money out of out of feeding that literally to you so i think it's really important that we don't beat ourselves up about it and also realize that nutrition for aging well and for better brain health doesn't have to be complicated it's really about fueling our lives and asking ourselves what do we want to be doing? How do we want to feel? We want to feel good. We want to be strong. Um, I've certainly post-menopause started eating more protein. That was not something I gave a lot of thought to previously. You know, we are losing muscle mass with age and uh, as estrogen declines, and we need to support rebuilding it with protein and also obviously working our muscles. Um, we're not going to just get muscle mass just by eating protein. Um, and I find with my health coaching clients, none of them are ever getting enough protein, um, by which I mean around a gram of protein uh, per kilo of lean body weight per day. Uh, and that's just a kind of simple, 
benchmark. And whenever my clients do the maths, they're never, never getting enough because we it's one of those things where we've tended to think, oh, you know, those, those kind of chunkier foods, like you know, a big piece of chicken or so, or even a small piece of chicken, you know, well, that's going to make me fat. I'll just have the salad kind of thing. And also the other thing, which I think is so important and you know, women have had the wrong message about for so long is eating fat. Mm. You know, we are a generation of women who were brought up to believe that fat would just make us fat uh, and everything should be low fat and everything you know, we should be cutting fat out of everything. And it makes me so angry we were sold that message because fat and uh, healthy fats by you know, olive oil, oily fish, nuts, avocado, the, that kind of thing are absolutely vital to how well we age and, and our brain health. You, our brain is a ball of fat and water. And if it's, it's not getting that nutrition, it's not going to function as well. So I think you, um, I try and eat for my brain. I try and get enough protein. I get oily fish, loads of green vegetables, some really clear research on green vegetable intake and um, lower risk of cognitive decline. Uh, so plenty of, that, plenty of other vegetables too, but you just green veg, lots of berries, fiber, lots of women not getting enough fiber either. And that's so important to the gut brain connection. Um, it's really important and we need uh, fiber to um, you know, help all that work and to feed our microbiota so it's not it's not difficult it's just um making it have making it a habit uh making it happen one of the first things i would say to my clients or a really easy thing to remember is berries greens greens if you're having three meals a day are you having a portion of berries with one and a portion of greens with two others really simple but it's just lodge that in your brain look at your plate are you getting those things that is that is absolutely brilliant advice and you know we always have the saying you are what you eat and i've heard some people say that's not true but mm. if you're not feeling well i think that the first place to go is our our diet what are what are we eating and how is that um affecting us and you know i know people that are sensitive to um, dairy or they're sensitive to um, you know different things and what's important so we're all individual and we need to work out for us and in the last week I've heard two women tell me that they they got rid of their IBS through their diet and they said they're so frustrated that they didn't understand that before and they they figured out what was irritating them what wasn't working for them and they totally changed how they felt so it's it's just so important isn't it yeah yes absolutely and it's 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 absolutely not the only thing as we were saying earlier but it is a really really important thing now i've i was one of those people that have been sucked in with the the sugar addiction i've definitely got a sugar addiction and it's something i've talked quite openly about i i've tried many things i've tried hypnosis that worked really well but then seems just to go um, I really struggle daily with not go, getting through the day without eating some sugar. I, and I, I do really try. As a result, my waist is not as it should be. And it's something I've really failed at. Even though I exercise almost every day, um, I don't drink much alcohol. I, I, but the thing is, I, I, and what makes it worse, I think, for me, is that I feel great. I really feel physically great. So... I'm hesitant about I am trying to always always trying to lose weight so in your book you talk about the importance of keeping the waist trim and how that can be really negative on our health if our waist is bigger and I'm sure there's many women out there who, who are feeling that their waist certainly around middle age has got bigger why is it important to keep our waist trim it is important because Studies show that storing fat around our internal organs, which often shows up a, as an apple-shaped body or a, a bigger waist, um, increases our risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, heart attacks, and inflammation as well, which is linked to many other uh, conditions. Um, and 
it it's it's that um subcutaneous fat the fat you know the fat around our middle that seems to have more of an impact on our health than perhaps a weight on our hips or our bums and what you're talking about here is the waist to hip ratio um and so we want to have bigger hips than we do waist measurement essentially um and the world health organization advises that i think for women it's 0.85 percent of uh for women uh 0.9 for men 0.9 percent uh 0.9 when you divide your waist measurement by your hip measurement so you want a less a measurement less than one essentially um when you do that uh calculation but i think again it's another thing is and we know that we put on weight around our middles as uh we get older we know that um estrogen has helped keep that kind of that waist smaller waist bigger hips kind of shape that we associate with fertility you know, estrogen has played a role in that so it's going to happen and it's another thing i think we don't want to beat ourselves up about it you, you are eating a really healthy diet you are exercising and you're in a time of life when your body composition is changing so it's it's going you're doing all the right things and i think you know, there is this culture of you you've got to look a certain way and do a certain thing and it's not always going to work and it you know, it's you know, it's not something that you want to feel miserable about although we know there are you know some health implications it you could there is a bigger picture here too about how you feel and generally how you feel and if you feel good that's really important great and the, the more great advice and, and you mentioned earlier, bit earlier about the myths around things like eating fat and I, I remember when i was young we had the whole margarine thing came in <laughs> and they told us that eating margarine was better than eating butter and again, the data, when they did the research, showed that that wasn't true, but it stuck for so long. And this low fat, you know, we now know that low fat, that, and, and one of the reasons is that the fat is, there's many fat soluble vitamins that are only found if you're having some fat. So we've just got all these myths. And another big area of myths for me in the nutrition part is uh, supplements. Um, I've, I've never been a big fan, um, and I've never really taken anything. I took phytic acid when I was pregnant and I do take vitamin D now. Um, what's, what's your view? I know you've changed your view on this. So how do you feel about supplements? I, yeah, so I don't take tons of supplements like you. I take vitamin D three and I take it with k2 which apparently helps move the calcium from our bloodstream where we don't want it to our bones where we do so that the two things work together so i take those together um and i take um i do take fish oil a uh, fish oil supplement because that is really important for brain health to be getting those essential fatty acids omega-3 the DHA in EPA, really important for brain health, I I believe. Um, and I also take a um, broad spectrum B vitamin for the same reason. Um, and the other thing I do take and su suggest to my clients that they take is um, magnesium, which really helps with sleep uh, for a lot of women. I take magnesium three and eight at night. That's a type of magnesium which crosses the blood brain barrier so supports brain health um and there's quite a lot of research around that which i think is robust enough for me to want to take it um so i do uh and i think it does help and if i don't take it for a while i notice um so i it's quite hard for us to get enough magnesium in our diet um and particularly the three and eight so that's what i take and I, I think, as you said there, you you realise if you don't take it, you, you see the effect. So I, I think that would be my message to people. We're all different. Taking a mass produced, you know, non-specific supplement, I, I personally don't think it's a good idea. If, if you're worried, you can get your levels checked 
um, to see whether you are deficient in any particular uh, vitamin or mineral and that you would need supplement. I think I think we need to be careful with how we do it and we need to figure out whether it is actually making a difference. So I think if you're trying some new supplements, um, so target them as you have and keep a diary to see whether you think it's actually making a difference. It does take quite a lot of time to have an effect, but just really see and don't just, my view would be not just to keep taking these big multivitamins and things without actually understanding, being in tune with your own body and understanding how it's working. Mm. And I think particularly with some of the supplements that are being marketed now for menopause or brain health or the <laughs> midlife or age, they've got so many different things in them. You need to be just need to be aware of what's in them because you might be you might not need that thing or you might need more of that thing. And you know, there's there's so much out there. There's so much very persuasive marketing. Um, it's it is as you say better to keep it simple. Uh, and work out what you really need. Yes, the menopause supplements. It has it has gone crazy, and uh, Jen Gunter is on a mission. And uh, I've be, but I've been supporting her with this as well. She, um, she she's just posted today about um, working out that if she made made some Jen Gunter's. Can't remember what what what, what vitamin it was anyway. It's a turmeric, I think she said um, potion. That she said, even if uh, you know a small number of her followers bought it, how much money she'd make in such a small time, even though it had no evidence that it was going to do anything. So, and she was very upset with so many doctors jumping on this this bandwagon. And these menopause supplements are amazing. Apparently, you lose weight and cure all your menopause supplements in one go with a with some lotion, but sorry, potion and. And the marketing, mm. as you said, and the testimonials, and they, they sometimes say backed by science. And then I've tried to look into it. And there's no science there. But it, this marketing on women's health is something that's really got my back up. Um, and it's just it's always got my back up for decades, but it's worse now than ever. So menopause supplements, is that a, is that a no from you? It's a no from me. <laughs> well, I did. I a friend of mine sent me recently some some marketing email she'd had from a brand and and you know, it had a sort of broad spectrum of, of vitamins and things in and I said look if you're feeling crap and you think this could help you try it and see because I think if that's important too sometimes you just think oh, I'm just going to buy this thing and it's going to help and I'll feel better and and you, that's not necessarily a bad thing so. I, I, it's not a, nothing is a hard no for me. I, yeah, I'm a coach. I meet people where they are and, and what, what do they need and how can I support them you know, at the point that they're at, at now? So, yeah, so try, try things. They're very expensive. <laughs> yeah. And they, we were talking about menopause. I mean, sleep is another area where there's huge numbers of, of supplements that, that, promise different things and some seem to work for some people so again it you know, if if you think it's worth if it's what if you feel it's worth you trying it um but yeah. be aware of the marketing team behind it <laughs> one one of the other myths uh well mate but one of the other new crazes which may or may not be a myth i'd like to know what you think about fasting um so you know some people are saying yes it's the best thing ever some people but I mean my view is that we're all individual it, I, for me I actually don't eat breakfast anymore but I listen to my body if I want it some mornings then I'll have it but most mornings I don't it's one o'clock now I've only had a tiny little piece of my sourdough that just came out of the oven before we started recording because I just couldn't resist but what's your view about fasting I think fasting is really interesting and it makes a lot of sense to me that our bodies need time to rest and digest. That constantly eating and therefore constantly putting our bodies in digestion mode, which is hard work. It's one of the hardest things we ask our bodies to do. You, that must take its toll on, on the body and particularly as we get older, 
we need time for the body to be able to repair. And if it's constantly digesting, then we're not giving it time to repair. So I, you know, I do think it is a good thing. I, I gently to um, restrict the amount of time that we are eating. It doesn't work for everybody. I think women experiencing severe menopausal symptoms who have a history of disordered eating really need to think very carefully about the restrictions they put on themselves. But I do think it makes sense for a lot of us to, within a 24-hour period, making sure there is a decent amount of time for our bodies to rest and digest and repair. I try and stick to a sort of, 10 hour eating window so a um, 14 hour fasting window so that means a later breakfast um, I don't eat dinner terribly early I think in the ideal world I would but your family life makes that quite tricky to eat dinner at six o'clock for example um, and you know ideally we would leave three hours between finishing eating and bedtime so that our bodies can digest and they allow enough time for insulin to do its work and then melatonin, which makes us feel sleepy, kick in. Um, that, that would be the ideal. So the longer we can leave between when we eat in the evening and when we go to bed, the better you are, you know, three, four hours, um, ideally, um, because our body will always prioritise digestion over melatonin production because it's hard work. Um, yes. so I, yeah, so generally, I, I think a gentle fast is a good thing. I'm not doing, you know, I'm not one of those people who does one meal a day, OMAD, one <laughs> meal a day. I think. I'm very hot, tough for women, I think, or sort of, you know, a week's water fast or that kind of thing. No, that's oh. all too hardcore and extreme for me. Yes, no, same for me. I, I've got a house full of teenage boys who are always hungry. So actually, we do oh, yeah. eat dinner at six and uh, that works really well for us. Um, mm. So that, that literally they come in and they're like, we need food. So we, we, we eat dinner at six. But I, I really like the advice about having three hours before you go to bed on a, you know, letting that digestion finish. And let's, let's keep on sleep. So, so many women have problems sleeping. And you've talked about magnesium as well, which I've heard so many people say how, how what other advice have you got about powering down i actually you know what you say powering down i think a really important thing which is quite foundational is powering up in the mornings and getting daylight first thing getting light on the eyeballs getting some movement ideally and that is just a walk for 10 20 minutes in the morning Getting out, saying so walk around the garden, have a look at the garden, take the dog out, just go for a walk, get some daylight because that kick starts the circadian rhythms, which in 12, 14 hours time are going to make us feel sleepy. And if we don't start that process, we can't end it at night. So I would say a good night's sleep starts in the morning. And actually of all the habits I have adopted in 10 years of writing about aging well I think that for me has made one of the biggest changes in my life because I sleep better I have a different rhythm to my day I start with movement and that helps us de-stress as well so I think that's that's really important uh, when it comes to sleep you think about think about sleep in terms of the whole day, the whole 24 hours, what are you doing in the 24 hours that's preparing you for sleep? Um, and regular sleep and uh, wake times uh, is really also really foundational for that. Anchoring our circadian rhythms, anchoring our clocks, they go a bit out of whack once we get past 50. And the more we can anchor them by saying, like, this is my sleep time and this is my wake time, uh, the better. Um, a really simple way I do that with my clients is to get them to set an alarm in the evening to say, this is now time to wind down. This is when we start to power down. So I have an alarm that goes off at 9.30 at night. And that's my kind of finish up, get off the screens, 
do the last kind of things you need to do, start getting ready for bed, and then a, another alarm goes off at 10, and that is, right, you know, face, teeth, pyjamas, bed, um, and then I'll read for a bit. But that but that gives that gives a kind of structure to my evenings, and what that does is deal with that way that we self-sabotage our sleep by faffing about in the evening and not going to bed and when I discovered the psychological term for this it was such a light bulb moment it is called revenge bedtime procrastination and that is when we take revenge on our difficult busy stressful days by carving out time for ourselves at night and that could be binge watching a show scrolling on social media just do it pottering about doing those kind of little jobs that you don't, didn't have time to do during the day like unload the washing machine and we're taking revenge on our busy days by not allowing us to sleep and so we end up feeling worse the next day because we didn't we didn't sleep as well as we should have done we didn't get to bed um, and so actually finding a way to cut through that with a, an evening alarm I have found um, incredibly helpful more great advice, Susan. Absolutely wonderful. And I think you're totally right. I, in the interviews for my book, I've asked if women have bedtime rituals, but also morning rituals and this getting outside and thinking about your rhythm for the day, I think it's so important. And Neil Stanley, I've only done one podcast on sleep with uh, Dr. Neil Stanley. Um, I am going to do some more. But um, he, he asked if right at the beginning of his book, he said, to people, you know, how do you, how are you feeling in, during the day on a scale of one to nine, where nine is um, totally awake and one's asleep? And I, I said, I, I know you're not going to want me to say nine, but so I'll say eight. Um, but he said, yeah, most people are feeling tired during the day because they haven't got that rhythm right, as you said. And so there's so many things we've got to think about. We have got to think about our, our, when we stop eating winding down powering down and then think about that right from the morning about getting 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 that sunlight getting outside and and doing the right things in the day that's really going to help our well-being through the whole day that, yeah. that's brilliant advice Susan and it helps us to reclaim ownership of our day and if you if you're thinking oh, I've got to get on the on the laptop at seven thirty in the morning you you're not getting much ownership of the day. So you doing something for ourselves at you know, as you know, as a starter, as a way of cranking up the day, I think you know, is is really important and does much more than just help us sleep. It you know, it helps you know, anchor who we are and what we're doing and, and how we prioritize ourselves. And the, the way I start the day, um I don't eat breakfast now, as I said. So I, so that's that's the other great thing is it saves you loads of time if you don't eat breakfast. <laughs> you reclaim a sort of half an hour of your of your morning. But I do exercise in the morning. I really like to exercise in the morning. And in your books, you say um, exercise is no longer an option. So what's the most important thing that you think women should know? I think I think there's lots of bombarding information out there obviously everyone says move and exercise but there's some things I've read about changing the way we exercise and that we shouldn't do so much high impact I've just done body attack I love my high impact I get such a buzz and I know that you said you still do hit classes so what do you advise women about exercising at this stage I, I the advice is just do it just do what you enjoy what doesn't hurt what um although don't be afraid of pushing yourself uh do what works for you what fits into your life i mean that generally is the advice i think there's some really good research around vigorous exercise whether that's you know, hit or just kind of going for it with the the cardio it's really good for brain health um, as well as cardiovascular health and everything else, but it helps us make more brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, creates conditions in the brain that grows more neurons, um, keeps the blood pumping through the blood-brain barrier, which is really, really important. So anything that gets us breathless and works us hard and 
what is hard work for one person isn't for another person. And so it's finding our own level and making that work and, and, and pushing ourselves. And and I talk to women, I'm sure you do too, who say, well, you know, I, I do a little bit, I do a little bit of mat pilates and I walk the dog and it's kind of, well, where are you getting sweaty? Where are you pushing yourself? What's hard? What's difficult? <laughs> yeah, what 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 is what is that moment where you're kind of pushing yourself? I think that's that's important to find and not to be afraid of exercising and getting sweaty and looking a bit stupid, really. And I know that can be hard. And the other thing is strength training. I think if if there's such a thing as a diamond bullet, strength training is it when it comes to aging well, longevity, better brain health. You, it's just so powerful when you know, when we contract our muscles, we're squeezing out proteins, which uh, I have seen described as hope molecules, which are really good for our mental health and our cognitive health. You, know, the, the act of actually squeezing our muscles has a physical impact on the rest of our bodies and our brains and if we have more muscle we are you know, we have better cardiometabolic health so we're we're absorbing that glucose um you know we have better bone health which is so important as we get older you know, we know fractures are very difficult to come back from um you know, harder to come back from so you know better to 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 be strong to support our bodies to make it less likely that we're going to fall and less likely that we're going to really damage ourselves if we do um so you know, muscle i think is you know, the most important thing and we, we know we're losing it once we're over the age of about 30 it's not even menopause it's just you know it's on the decline i um I, I think it's really good to mix everything up. Um, so I, I know people that just do yoga and I think yoga is great. And I, I try to do, I, I don't do yoga so much, but I do a class called body balance, which I just absolutely love. Um, as you said, weights are important, but yeah, I, I keep seeing all these exercise gurus on social media say postmenopause women shouldn't do um, aerobic exercise. And I just, I, I don't know. I think that's a bit of a fad that's, um, they say it's not good for our metabolism and, but it's, but it's great. And it, as you said, it gets blood everywhere. And when, when, when we're going red, you know, the, the blood's going to places it hasn't been to for a while. It's, and it's also doing that in turn, it's going all around our brain and it's moving faster. It's taking things away from ourselves and bringing new things to ourselves. So I, I really, but, but everyone's individual. So I think what's important is people do what's right for them and what they enjoy. If they're not enjoying their exercise, then that's a disaster and they won't keep it up. So finding things you enjoy, it might just be dancing. It might be a walk, but try to do a fast walk. Uh, but the, I think everyone would say the, the weights, <clears throat> the weights are really important. And, and, Going back to right at the beginning, what we were talking about, relaxing and the stress, I think doing um, classes where there is some meditation. My body balance class has a meditation at the end. My teacher's got the most amazing voice. I always sort of nod off. <laughs> um, but having that slow time as well and slow stretches is, is really important. Yes, yes. And stretching for flexibility is really important but also yes just slowing down getting back into our bodies um and you know any form of uh, meditation is really great for stress reduction i really like yoga nidra which is the kind of lying down guided meditation uh element uh of uh yoga there's no kind of stretching or like involved it, it's just listening uh, to the uh, teacher uh sharing their nidra and that's really great for sleep or you if you're very fatigued it helps um you feel more rested it's a win-win we've talked about mm. so many different topics and you've got lots yeah. more that you talk about in your books that are really important for our aging and for our brain health are there three top tips that you would like to give women about healthy aging and looking after our brains? 
Oh, that's a really big question. Um, I think what I say to women a lot is put your brain first. And the reason I say that is because I think so much of our health has been bound up historically in how we look. You know, we think you know, we have been uh, culturally shaped to think as women about how we look and think about what we eat and how we exercise and how we interact with the world in terms of how we look and and not we haven't been valued for our brains uh, historically and if we if we turn that around and think about our brains what does my brain need what do i want to, what's going to stimulate me intellectually what does my brain need me to eat what does my brain need me to do in terms of movement that just changes perception and I feel that is really key. Um, other things I would say, move more than you think you need to, particularly outside. I think we're very locked into our, uh, into our sort of internal spaces and getting outside and moving in any way is really important. And find your tribe. You know, who are the people who are going to support you and stimulate you as you go through this process, as you go through the second half of your adult life, we have changed and the, you may need to change some of the people around you uh, to reflect that. So find the people who will do that for you. I am very glad you mentioned Find Your Tribe because it was something that I was going to ask you a question on, but I was thinking of time and that obviously... You talk about this in your books as well, but our social interactions, our connections with other people are so important. And I was on someone's focus group the other day as a participant, and they said, what's the most important thing you think that's happened to you post-menopause? And for me, it was realising that I have much more positive relationships with women than I've ever had in my life. And... I'm very aware that I've got fantastic women's circles that I'm part of. And some of them, some, quite a few of them overlap. Um, but I've got various tribes, various circles of women that give me so something that I've never really taken so much note of in my life. But they're just, they've just become very, very powerful. And, and a great example um, if any of my school friends are listening, we've got 10 school friends that we're still very connected. But over the over the decades, as we used to meet, um, not not quite so often when we were having kids and you know doing things over the last sort of 50, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, but um, sometimes when we used to meet, we'd come away and there'd be some little cliques and there'd be little you know, grumblings and some people would have a little row. But I've really realised in the last years, as every time we've come together, it's just been love. We're the same people, basically, mm -hmm. but we have we come away with the most wonderful sense of love and togetherness. And all of those negative things, they've faded away. They're not there anymore. I'm very, very looking forward to seeing them all again next month. And that that was a really light bulb moment for me when I realised, wow, these relationships have come on to a totally different place. And this wonderful tribe of women, we are now on, on a different wavelength, really, which is wonderful and positive and so full of love. Yeah. So uh, community, friendships, um, tribes, women's circles, I think are really, really important. And it's never too late to make new friends. No, no, absolutely. And it, it does kind of fill up your soul, doesn't it? When you spend time with, with great women or, or you're, you're very old friends with you, whom you've had relationships for you know, 40, 50 years and you, you feel, you feel better. You, you are, well, you, you are better. You know, it, it's so good. It's so good for you. It's so powerful. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's really exciting and you know, we should all be doing more of it. Yes, definitely, definitely. Now, Susan, I thank you so much. We're, we're going to finish with some questions that I ask all of my guests. And I think finishing on, on our women's relationships it was a wonderful way to finish. But I ask all my guests, um, my podcast called Why Didn't Anyone Tell Me This, 
is there something in your coaching that you've or through writing your books that you found that women are um you know wish that they'd known about before the light bulb moment well i think we've touched on this already but actually a lot of women say to me i didn't no, no one told me that I could feel great post-menopause, <laughs> that it was going to be okay, that I come out the other side. It's not the end. Um, and so I think that yeah, that that's a positive you, because we have had this sort of narrative that, that menopause is just nothing but awful. And I know it can be very difficult, as we've talked about, but you know, actually you can come out and think, oh, wow, look at all this opportunity. And that is what we don't talk about enough. Oh, Susan, I love that. I love that. No one's ever said that. And I'm, that's a brilliant, brilliant answer. Thank you so much. And we did talk about happiness. So I'm going to ask you now, what makes you happy and where is your happy place? So what makes me happy? Um, you, a cliche, I suppose, uh, my family being with them. Uh, my elder daughter has just been in, in Australia for a year and she came back recently and we had the four of us in the car for the first time for 15 months or something. Uh, and you know, her husband was driving. I was in the passenger seat, two girls now in their 20s in the back seat. And I thought, oh, this is so lovely just being in the car together. Uh, so... <laughs> So oh. it's not very exotic kind of happiness, but a, a very lovely kind of warm hearted uh, happiness. My happy place very specifically um, is called a place called Skult Head Island, uh, a tidal island off the northwest coast of Norfolk, um, sort of beyond the creeks. Uh, and it's very beautiful. Um, but more generally, being by the sea always makes me very happy. Yes, we, we need to go swimming by the sea. We've got so many women who are several of the women I've been interviewing for my book have moved to the sea and I'm so jealous of them. Um, I can't do that yet because of my kids, um, but I've got a camper van and I'm spending a lot of time by the sea. Just spent last weekend at Bournemouth, which was very, very magical. So the sea, yeah, wonderful, wonderful place. And the very final question what advice would you give your younger self? I would say it really doesn't matter what other people think. It's true. <laughs> that is true. And one of the common threads that's come out for my interviews with women over 50 is um, they actually say, I won't say the word because I, don't want to sue everybody, but they said they don't give an F anymore. <laughs> they, you know, and unfortunately that light bulb moment happens normally when you're older. So yes, advice to your younger self is, yeah, don't, don't fret about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It, I mean, that is a really interesting condition or part of the postmenopausal condition that you just don't worry so much about that stuff. I mean, that's just so liberating. It's so liberating. It it really, really is. And um, yeah, I, it, you know, it's great. It's great. I could say a lot about it, but I won't. It's great. Susan, I'm so glad we finally done it. Um, your your books and your work are just so fabulous. It just, you know, when you've got your own views about things and you think you might be a bit opinionated, and then you read someone else's words and they're totally in line. It's such a relief. And I will be quoting you a lot in my book. And if people haven't read your books yet, uh, please, please read Susan book, Susan's books and please follow her. And we want to be sure mm -hmm. that everyone ages well and has great brain health. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you so much, Joyce. I've really enjoyed it.